Well, happy Sabbath to you. Thank you for tuning in today. I have a message for you that I have entitled Understanding the Will of God. Uh, my main passage for today is Romans 12, verses 1 through 3. By the way, my name is Joe Savino. I'm the pastor of the wonderful Wenatchee Seventh-day Adventist Church in beautiful Wenatchee, Washington, and I'm glad that you have tuned in. Why don't we just get started with a word of prayer? Lord in heaven, thank you so much for the, these moments that we can share together. We pray that your spirit will teach us what you have in mind, and we thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, these are crazy times. I don't need to be reminding you of that, but it helps me as I start my message today to, uh, to have us re remember that these are, these are just crazy times. For many of us, it's been crazy for years, I know. But in, in recent years, in, in the recent past, our world has just clearly been turned upside down, hasn't it? First, we had the virus. And then we had the political unrest over world and national response to the virus. And then the fallout in, in businesses, the small ones, the large ones, it didn't matter, with thousands of uh, those businesses just closing their doors forever, impacting livelihoods not only around the United States, but, uh, but globally, wouldn't you agree? And now we have these new waves of sickness that are resulting in forced vaccinations uh, that are now being met with defiance in the name of free choice. And then you have a lot of conspiracy the theories and, and a major distrust of those in government who are supposed to be watching out for us, you know. People are just pulling their hair out and I don't have much left, right? And that defiance of these, these forced vaccinations and things like that, the masking in stores or, you know, all of those things that are uh, hot topics today, that is now being met with impending pink slips uh, resulting in what looks like it is going to be a, a loss of millions of jobs and possibly financial collapse and despair. Have a nice day. <laughs> Now, I wanted to, you know, make that uh, sort of an opener for us because we need some help here, don't we? We need to know what to do in these unprecedented times, to overuse a word that's uh, been at the front of a lot of pages these days, right? And some of us, honestly, are on the verge of having to make some huge decisions about the course of our lives and the lives of our family members, aren't we? We don't know if we'll have a job tomorrow. We don't know what, what our health is going to be like tomorrow. We don't know what kind of plans to make for the future. Uh, if we're out of a job or if we're out of a home, or if our business collapses, you know, we just don't know. And we're going to have some huge decisions to make. Now, I share all that because I have noticed that there often comes a point in an eager Christian's life when they want to know what does God want me to do about this? Whether it's what I've just described today or maybe some other situation in your life and some other challenge that comes to you, some other opportunity that comes your way, whatever it is, an eager Christian wants to know what does God want me to do about this? What is God's will for my life right now in the middle of whatever it is that I'm facing? But for me, the idea that God had a purpose for my life, as we, we've all been taught, that idea made a great impact on my life long ago when I read Ephesians 2.10. It's a familiar verse if you've read much of your Bible, where it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. He's got a plan for us because it says, Which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, yeah, yeah, you connect that with Jeremiah 29, 11, that tells us God has a plan for us. God prepared in advance some kind of good work for you and me to do. That passage, Ephesians 2, 10, told me that God has something then that he wants me to do. And it tells me there's something that God wants you to do as well. You see, because we are Christians, God has a purpose for us. He has a destiny 
for us to fulfill. He wants to put us to work for his purposes, doesn't he? So how do I know what his purpose is? How will I know what God wants me to do with the life that he's given me to live? Well, knowing God's will for our lives actually isn't that hard. Uh, in fact, it's really quite simple. I shared with you a few years ago some very basic things uh, that God's made clear about his will for your life. And, uh, and since a few of you recently in just con our conversations have brought it up, they have brought up this topic of what is, the, what is God's will right now for each one of us personally, well, I decided to go back and research some of what I had studied years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that even if you recognize some of what I'm going to share from something you know I shared years ago, because I know you hang on every word that I share. Anyway, I hope it'll still be a blessing for you, and I hope that this will maybe establish, more firmly establish for you, your understanding of how to know God's will, because that's what I want to talk about. I do find this topic very interesting, so I might get a little bit uh, accelerated or animated uh, as we talk about it today. Uh, were you to be at, at church, you would re receive a bulletin insert, um, and uh, it's, it's going to be filled up on both sides, but very uh, sparsely, but for, for people to fill in, and you'll notice on the slides that I'll have some areas. If you want to get a piece of paper and a pencil, I think there are a couple of things you may really want to write down, okay? You have the, uh, the uh, benefit of being able to press pause, <laughs> all right? So you might need to do that as I give you things to write down. But on one side of this bulletin insert, this note-taking guide that I've made, uh, it, it says, Understanding the Will of God. And uh, I give the, the verse, Proverbs 3, 5, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and, and lean not on your own understanding. We want to understand the will of God. So here we go. The first point is, and most importantly, that we clearly know is God's will, is that he wants each of us to be saved. He wants us to be saved, right? Isn't that what uh, his whole purpose is, is to reconcile us to God? John 3.16 tells us, that's our, our, our major uh, fanfare for this point, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And, and of course, until we choose to commit to that purpose in our lives, nothing else really matters. Really. And I should just say right now, if you don't belong to Jesus Christ, if you have not personally committed to him and accepted his sacrifice for, for your salvation, his sacrifice for your sins, and accepted his salvation, the act of, his act of saving you, something you couldn't do for yourself, if you haven't been buried in the waters of baptism, this morning you need to make that decision. Sooner rather than later, you see where this world is going, and I imagine that you're going to agree with me. So if you haven't yet made that decision, you've been putting it off, you know, and said, saying, one day I'll do that. Now is the day. Today's the day. Talk to me. Talk to anyone in spiritual uh, authority, you might say, over you, who can help you with that. Get that done, all right? And then now we're going to go forward assuming you've gotten that done, because once you've got that done, then, number two, uh, once you belong to him, he wants you to live a special kind of life. A special kind of life. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. That's, that's an old-fashioned word that simply means made more and more like Jesus throughout your lifetime. It's God's will that you become sanctified over time, become more and more like Jesus. That passage goes on to say, after saying that, that, that you live that special kind of life by being sexually pure and by treating others with honesty and kindness. But there's so much more to uh, imitating Jesus, becoming more and more like Jesus. Wouldn't you agree? But that's what that uh, passage says. So the Bible makes it clear that when you and I belong to God, 
His will is that our lives should reflect that special relationship we have with Him, not in order to get to heaven, not in order to be saved, but because we are saved, we should re let that re be reflected in the life that we live, all right? In fact, number three, He wants us to live our lives as a model for the world to see. You see, 1 Peter 2.15 tells us that. He, he, it says, For it is God's will that by doing good, by living this life that others can see, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. That's simply saying that we should live such decent lives. We don't have to be, you know, uh, sup supremely perfect, right? Uh, but we should live such decent lives that even those who hate Christ won't have anything to accuse us of, those of us who re represent Christ. So he wants us to live a special kind of life and be a model for others. And then four, uh, we're told that he wants us to live grateful lives, focused on God's blessings. You know, uh, like I told you earlier, and I don't know, I like to blame my heritage, but I might be wrong in doing that. It just might be me. <laughs> but I like to wave my hands a lot, and I like to raise my voice a lot, and I like to sound like I'm complaining. Well, I just talk this way. This is how I've always talked, and I get kind of animated and candid, and so forgive me if it looks like I'm complaining. I'm just trying to get a point across, and that's how I do it. Maybe I need to work on that, but I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> anyway, but we shouldn't be known as complainers. That's the point. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which is just two verses after my favorite passage in the Bible, but it tells us to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And you know, there, there are a lot more things that the Bible tells us but, uh, about God's will for our lives, but these passages that I just shared right now, these are the ones that explicitly say this is God's will for a Christian's life. You know, he's just outright obvious, right? And, uh, and so we can understand that it doesn't matter what Christian this is about, this is God's will for, for each one of us. Now that's just generic will of God stuff that'll be true for every single Christian. But what I want to know and what you want to know is what's God's will for me now in my life today, this daily grind that I experience. You know, honest questions like, 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 who does God want me to marry? Who does he want me, where does he want me to live? Uh, what does he want me to do for a living? Some of you might be having to make that decision soon if you are terminated from your job for one reason or another, right? What does he want me to do for a living? College students ask that a lot, or high school students often do. What kind of ministry could I do that God could bless? These are important questions. Wouldn't it be nice if, if God just had a magic eight ball, you know, that we could consult with, with those questions so we could just know his will automatically? We just see his answer float to the top, right? But God doesn't need a magic eight ball. He doesn't need horoscopes or palm readings or tea leaves or tarot cards. He doesn't need any of those things. The truth is that God is fairly explicit on how we can know his will for our lives. And it's right here in our, our passage for today, in Romans 12, verse 2 of this passage, it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, which we're going to talk about in a little while, but be transformed by how? By the renewing of your mind. We'll talk about that in a bit. Then, and only then will you be able to test and approve what God's will is. By the way, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, the key to discovering God's will for your life is to make yourself available. Make yourself ready for the time when God wants to do something in you. Make yourself ready. Make yourself available. And naturally, you and I would then ask, how do I make myself available? How do you make yourself ready? 
Okay, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes because I'm not done laying a foundation here, okay? Uh, but on our way to that, to answering that question, let's do a little exercise. I would like us to discover three ways that God expresses his will to his children because he does. Three different ways that are interconnected very, very well. And I'm going to explain that to you. Three ways that God expresses his will, his overall will, to his children, okay? First, you'll see that uh, we'll see God's providential will. That's what I'm calling it. His providential will. These are things that God's going to do or he's already done, no matter what. I mean, there doesn't need to be any agreement on your part or mine. We don't have to obey him. We don't have to have faith in him. God's going to do these things or has done them no matter what. If, if you look at the first of these verses that I, I put on this sheet, Galatians 4, 4 and 5, here's an example of that. It says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, without asking you and me, but he sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Okay, now, of course, Paul is writing a letter to the Galatian Christians. He's teaching them about law and grace. He's teaching about where we stand with God and uh, what God expects of us and things like that. That's another kind of another topic. But to, to, uh, to explain these things, he says something that, that God chose to do without your or my agreement at all. God just did it. All right, that's his providential will. And those other texts that I gave you uh, that, that you might see on the screen here, Revelation 20, Micah 5, Matthew 2, Acts 1, uh, they, they give more examples of God's pro, uh, providential will. Okay, these things don't depend on our faith. They don't depend on our obedience at all. Okay, that's his providential will. I hope you understand that. Second is his moral will. These are basically the thou shalt nots and the thou shalts. You know what I mean? Um, uh, God's already answered certain questions. It's not just the Ten Commandments. All, all through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and so many other places, Jesus gave us a lot of do's and don'ts. Uh, if the Christian is going to live a life that reflects God, here's what that looks like, right? Uh, uh, we don't have to ask certain questions. God has provided that in his word. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, at the very beginning of that verse, it says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, right? Sanctified means become more and more like God's son over the span of your life. God wants you to reflect his son. And then the verses that follow, uh, that that the rest of chapter uh, of verse 3 and the uh, the next couple of verses, they tell, uh, they give a list, you, you could say, of what that would look like, okay? So God wants us to be sanctified. And these other texts that I, I'm putting on the screen explain themselves like that, uh, like that one does too in Exodus 20 and 1 Peter 2. Okay, so that's God's moral will. He's laid out throughout Scripture what he wants our lives to look like. And third is God's personal will that we're finally getting around to. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the nuts and bolts of our lives. You know, should I do this? Should I do that? That's what a lot of us are at, at, at the, the threshold of, right? This is where we're having to make certain personal decisions, and we want to know what God thinks of it. Should I do this? Should I do that? Specific decisions we each have to make and his personal will for each of us specifically. Over in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, as an example, was bold enough to introduce his letter by, by saying he knew that he had been called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He, he wrote it that way. Called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, that wasn't uh, necessarily true for another guy, or, or this guy over there, or this lady over here, but, but, uh, but Paul knew that, he, and he was bold enough to say that God had called him specifically. God's personal will for Paul was that he serve as an apostle of Jesus Christ. All right? So there's one example, and then we can, we can actually uh, see an actual description of those who suffer uh, 
according to God's will over in 1 Peter 4.19. What? Someone might be surprised that if you're given over to Christ, you, you, you would suffer. But, you know, real Christians, don't be offended at my statement here, but real Christians understand how that can be true. I mean, all you have to do is look at Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph, man, did he suffer or what? He suffered all over the place for quite some time. And in the end, it served a greater purpose. And he conceded that, right? He was faithful all the way through that suffering. And then you look at Job as well. Here, here's a man who was, who was blameless, right? And went through so much, but God had a greater purpose. He had to deal with Satan. He had to teach Job a lesson, and he had to teach you and me a lesson, right? So there are Christians all the way th down through, through the centuries, down through what we call Christendom, who have suffered even martyrdom, right? Torture and martyrdom for God's greater purposes, all right? So now I've just shared these three ways that God expresses his will to his people. So to review, God has a providential, a moral, and a personal will for each one of us. Now I want you to be sure you understand them well as we go on. So if you have to, and I'm sure you'd love to, just rewind so I can explain it to you again. But if you've got it, let's move on because I want you to fill in something right now. Write this down. Uh, based on what I've just shared, I'd like uh, you to, to get this next statement. It's like the punchline of the whole message, even though I'm probably not much more than halfway through it, okay? And it goes like this. The more familiar you become with the providential will of God, in other words, the more aware you become of what God's going to do anyway, with or without our permission, or what God's already done or set in motion, the more familiar you become with that, and the more obedient you become to the moral will of God, in other words, what God already wants us all to do, right, that he's laid out in his word, then the, more, the easier it'll be for you to discover the personal will of God. Does that make sense? I'm going to say it once more because I know it's a mouthful. The more familiar you become with the providential will of God, and the more obedient you become to the moral will of God, the easier it will be for, for you to discover the personal will of God. See, and so many people go, go through their lives and whenever the heat is on, whenever they're, they're dismayed, they're, whenever they're overwhelmed and they just say, why won't God tell me what he wants me to do? Well, maybe they're not able to discern that because they have not followed these, you know, or these three steps, or these, they're not aware of this strategy that God has for us to become uh, familiar with his providential will, for us to become obedient to his moral will, and then we'll find it a lot easier to discern his personal will for us. And I really like that strategy that God has. So hopefully you get that. Now I want to give you an object lesson about these three things, these, these three ways that God expresses his will to us. Uh, you should see on your screen a, a picture of, uh, well, maybe you can tell me what that is. Some of you uh, have been involved in construction per, or building things, and you know what this is. I'll just tell you, since you can't tell me through the, through the screen here, uh, it's a plumb bob. Uh, or, some, or a plumb line, uh, people call it both things, and maybe they call it something, some other things too. And uh, at church, I'm going to actually probably go down the, the aisle and ask someone to tell me about it. I, I'm going to have one. Dan Perschel got one, and he's going to bring it to me anyway. I hope he'll have it. And uh, he's going to, and I want to ask someone to tell me about what this plumb bob or plumb line does. And uh, and they're going to tell me something along the lines of it helps us to build things straight, right? If you hang this thing straight and it stops wobbling around and it just hangs there uh, dead, it's going to be perfectly straight. And then you can put your studs up 
you know, perfectly straight alongside it. And then you'll know that everything else is going to be built according to it and it's going to be straight. And when you put your bowl of cereal or your, or your cup of water on the kitchen sink, it's going to be level, right? Uh, everything's built according to the plumb line. The plumb line determines what everything else around it is going to do. You get the, you get the analogy yet? Masons actually use a horizontal plumb line that I've never had to work with before. But, you know, they're building uh, concrete block walls or brick walls, and they use a horizontal plumb line so that uh, they know exactly how level each course that they lay is going to be. So in the end, if it's a, if it's a foundation for a house or something, then the house is going to be level, and that's, uh, that, that cup of water is going to be nice and even. It's not going to spill out when you put it on the kitchen sink. If you haven't figured it out by then, you're in trouble, right? And so they use a horizontal plumb line. And here's the point. God's providential and his moral wills provide and determine the plumb line for everything else that God is going to call or ask you to do in his personal will for you. Don't you think it'd be important to understand the providential will and the moral will of God then? They are the standard by which all other decisions are made. They set the course. They uh, set the pattern and the standard for what God is going to call you to do. Therefore, the more familiar you are with and the more surrendered you are to God's plumb line, the easier it is for you to decide and to discern all of those unknown things. And so, again, it's right there in Romans 12 too. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, the renewing of your mind, that's what these three uh, ways that God expresses himself to us are all about. They help to renew our mind if we'll pay attention to them, right? Then it says, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. So let's see, as we saw before here earlier, the for the follower of Christ, the key to learning God's will for your life is to make yourself available or ready for the time when God wants to do something amazing in you, okay? When God wants to work in some way or another uh, through you. And I said we'd come back to, to this, and that is, the question, how do we make ourselves ready? How do you make yourself ready? I'm going to tell you how you know how. Because I've preached about it for years. And you've probably told your kids that. Uh, kids this uh, for years too. And it's true. It always comes back to this. You make yourself ready by learning to think like God thinks. And you learn to think like God thinks by reading your Bible, by going to church, by attending Sabbath school, by going to small groups, and by surrounding yourself with people who share your Christian values and who can encourage you spiritually. That's why you get together with them. You just don't go on a hike because the weather's good and, and, and stay away from other groups of people who can encourage you spiritually in a spiritually growing environment, which I like to call church, right? And, and Sabbath school and, well, all of these other things, right? In other words, you soak God's thinking into your mind by doing all of these things. And these are some of the best tools that he uses. Th these, are not, these are his ideas, not the church's ideas, to help you with that, to help you do that, to make yourself ready and available for God to do something amazing through you by, by, uh, by, by making his will known to you, right? More discernible to you. And fortunately, most, but not all of you, know that. And that's why you've either tuned in today or that's why, you know, you'll, you'll be at church uh, whenever you're able to come. You understand that. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir today, but not all of you. Some of you were dragged there, <laughs> right? Some of you were dragged into the room to watch this. Some of you get dragged regularly to church 
and you don't appreciate that. But for most of you, I'm preaching to the choir. You know how important these things are. That's exactly how, by the way, some of the great men and women of the Bible prepared themselves uh, for God's purpose. Uh, the story of David is an excellent example, wouldn't you agree? Many people think of David as just like appearing on the scene one day uh, from out of nowhere to confront this big giant out on the field of battle. And that's the first you might know of him because you just know the big stories, right? If, you, if you've read David's story, then, then in reality, you know that David had been preparing for that confrontation long before that fateful day, hadn't he? As a boy, he'd spent his days out in the fields doing what? He was watching his father's sheep, right? That was his job for his dad. But do you, do you think he'd been, that, that, that he'd been uh, idly spending his time gazing on the flocks, you know, out in the field or, or just laying there with a piece of straw in his, uh, coming out of his mouth and looking at the clouds and, and thinking that looks, like a, that looks like a penguin and that looks like a, a, you know, a bunny rabbit and that looks like a ca cotton candy. Yes, they had cotton candy back then. No, I don't know. No, he wasn't doing that. He wasn't wasting his time while the sheep were out there grazing. He had spent that time meditating on the law of God, hadn't he? And, and Psalm 1, he wrote most of the Psalms, right? And Psalm 1, verse 2, tells us that, that he, he spent all of his time meditating on the law of God. It says day and night. Day and night he did that. In fact, David was so involved in that activity that he began to write songs that spoke of the glory of God from what he had found in the scriptures, right? That's where we got the Psalms. And David felt honored, by the way, when, when he got brought into the court of King Saul to, ease, to help ease that king's tortured mind if you know the story, and he would ease the king's mind with those very psalms that he had written while he was out in those fields, right? And so when David went out onto the field of battle, you know, against Goliath, he had long been prepared by his constant exposure to God's mindset, so much so that he became offended, not personally, but on behalf of God, right? by Goliath's taunts, and he went out there on the field of battle to declare in 1 Samuel, uh, what, 17, 40, 45, he said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, buddy, <laughs> sorry, and the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You know what he was saying to big, big boy Goliath? He was saying, good luck. That's what he was saying. See, David had allowed God's thinking to transform his own thinking. He, he, you know, he understood this principle. The problem is that there is a kind of thinking that competes with God's kind of thinking, and Romans 12 calls it the pattern of this world. Remember, I told you we'd come back to this? The pattern of this world. The world constantly tries to conform me to its way of thinking, you know, square peg, round hole, but it's going to get me in there if I'm the square peg, right? It is constantly trying to fit me into its mold, its way of thinking, the pattern of this world. And it does that by the books it turns out, it does that by the biased news reports, and the movies, and the TV shows, and the sitcoms that it offers to us, and the video games we could play, and all the way down to the societal games it plays with Christianity in general. You know, all these other uh, world religions seem to be praised anymore in our country, but you dare mention principles that are based on scripture, or Christianity, and oh no, you're a bigot. Oh no, you're you know you're all of these things. A homophobe, a xenophobe. Uh, you know you can make the list. I, I keep forgetting it. Uh, you know, but we get called all kinds of names if we promote this one kind of uh, religious thinking. All the other ones are fair game. Isn't that an interesting thing? And no, I don't. I don't mean that everything we watch or read has to be Christian, though it's not a bad idea. But we've got to be careful about what we allow into our homes and into our minds. 
And let's be truthful. We adults know this is true, don't we? Or we wouldn't care so much about uh, what our kids get exposed to. You know, we wouldn't be blocking access to certain stuff on their computer, you know, if we didn't know this was true. But the sadder truth is that somehow we've, we've bought into the notion that the things that are dangerous for kids are somehow okay for us. You know, we can handle it because we're more mature. We call it adult programming. I call it childish programming myself, but we call it adult programming as if it won't unduly influence us when in fact we know that it does. You know, I, I know people who try to defend their own personal lifestyle choices nowadays by saying to the rest of us, it's the way it is these days. You know, uh, you just best fa uh, face it, get used to it. It's the new normal. Oh, I, I cringe when I hear that. I just cringe when I hear that. You know, they say that about, you know, our, our lifestyle now under COVID, it's the new normal. Or they say that about, you know, the profane language uh, in movies and, and uh, in the grocery stores and, and the, the smut that's being put out here and the poor behavior that uh, is being promoted among uh, people in, in business practices and all these other things. It's the new normal. You better just get used to it. They work so hard at defending that and hey, they could be right. It might be true that that is the new normal, but not because it's better for us, not because it's more appropriate, not because it's healthier, not because it's more fulfilling, not because life is more rewarding when you follow that course. No, it might be true today simply because of our constant exposure to the pattern of this world. We're stuck here, you know? We're exposed to it all the time. The devil has cunningly slipped it in over time, sort of like in our public school systems, and look what we have today. And the devil has fabricated a new normal, and then he sends people out to tell you that you need to embrace it, right? You know it's true. It's true and you know it's true. <laughs> and the more we see of it, the more normal that pattern appears to us. And we are being conformed to the pattern of this world. So we can agree with those people who say it's the new normal, but we don't have to admire them. Instead, Romans says that the key to learning God's will for our personal life is to soak God's way, God's kind of thinking into your mind so that you'll be ready when he wants to do something big and amazing in your life. So let's go back to the original set of questions I asked earlier with that kind of a mindset. And we can answer each one of those questions with a question. Look at these. First I asked, who does God want me to marry? I would answer that question with a question and I would say, Do that, does that person please God? Does that person please God? Then maybe I'd consider marrying them. You know, I've fallen in love with them anyway, but do they please God? Then I have my answer, don't I? Because God's my focus. He is my first and foremost focus. The ne next question was, where do, does he want me to live? And the question would be, can I serve God there? You know, can I serve God in that place? Uh, the next question uh, that I shared was, what does he want me to do for a living? Some of you might be facing that soon. You know, if you're standing by your principles, you know, in regard to, I don't know, uh, vaccinations or masking or certain uh, behaviors at, at, uh, at work, or even at school, or, uh, or you know, the, the terrible things that uh, the law is forcing institutions to teach people about diversity training, and a number of those things, that, that some of which go way too far. You know, and so you're standing for your principles, whatever they are, and you just might be having to look for a new job. What does God want me to do for a living if I have a career change, or if I'm in high school and I'm now thinking about uh, a career? 
The question that I would answer that question with is, can I use that job to witness for him? Can I use that job to serve others in a way that, that introduces them to Jesus? You see, God is first. And then the, the, I think the last question I asked was, what kind of ministry can I do that would please uh, God? Uh, these are all honest questions, aren't they? How can I please God? What kind of ministry should I be involved in? The question I would respond to uh, that question with is, what am I positioned to do that's going to honor him right now? Right now, how am I positioned? What, what are the circumstances that will allow me to honor God? You know, that could be my ministry, the ministry that God wants me to to do. So when we ask questions like that, we don't need to flail our hands up in the up in the air. God has given us a strategy. He has given us a program, a certain operation, operating principles by which he can uh, help us to understand and discern his will for our lives. And if you and I will put God first in our decision making, he'll always find a way to use us. His word assures us that he'll always find a way to reveal his will to us so, so we can let him do what he wants to do in us. God's in control. And he knows, he knows our hearts. And if he sees a desire in my heart that I should be inside his will, within his will, somehow, you know what? He, he is going to make it happen. The key thing, again is that you always make yourself available for God to use you. That's the step that many of us skip over. And then we wonder why God's not speaking to us. And if you'll do that, then you'll always be ready for God to do His will in your life. God has a purpose for our lives, a destiny for us to fulfill. And my friend, I tell you this to give you hope. Like Paul always wrote to his... his recipients, the Christians in the very various churches he wrote to. I, I tell you this to give you hope. We can count on God to work out his will in our lives. All we have to do is make ourselves available to him, and he'll do it. Thanks for joining me today. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord in heaven, you are indeed very good to us. What a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before you. Heaven and earth adore you. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you for showing us in a new way, perhaps for some, uh, just what it means and what is involved in, uh, in understanding your will for us most deeply. And we thank you for this beautiful time that we've enjoyed together today. And we pray that you'll bless us to be faithful and to enjoy you in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today. I hope that you have a great rest of the Sabbath, and I'll see you either here on this screen next week, or maybe if you can make it to church, it's even better. All right? God bless you, and we'll see you next time.